A long time ago, I watched a masterpiece of a movie known as Theodore Rex. It was so good, my brain didn't have the capacity to retain any information from it. So when I came around to finally making this video, it was as if I was experiencing the movie for the very first time. The fact that my childlike brain couldn't handle the sheer glory of this film is a testament to the amount of skill issue I had as a kid. Okay, I'm done. I can't keep up with this joke anymore. I would probably sound like a broken record if I said Theodore Rex was one of the worst dinosaur movies ever created. I'm too sexy for my clothes. <laughs> but I don't care. I'm gonna say it anyways. This movie is extremely bad. For those of you that don't know, Theodore Rex is a movie from 1995 starring Whoopi Goldberg in a buddy cop comedy taking place in a futuristic world where dinosaurs were brought back to life and are now living amongst the humans. One of these dinosaurs, a T-Rex named Theodore, who was also a low-tier cop, is suddenly bumped up and partnered with Goldberg's character, Katie Coltrane, a part cyborg, part human detective, I guess, to solve a couple of murders and stop the evil villain from his plans of causing another extinction to dominate the world. Really, it doesn't sound like anything that's too against the grain for a 90s action comedy movie. It certainly has that over-the-top concept and zaniness to fit the bill for one, but after its release, the movie would quickly become notorious for being one of the worst of its kind. Among several other things, but we'll get to that in due time. The movie itself has built up a pretty bad reputation over the years. Let's just say that if Blade Runner and the sitcom Dinosaurs fucked while they were each blackout drunk, then had a hideous baby neither wanted to claim credit for, it would probably look and feel a lot like 1995's Theodore Rex. Theodore Rex is kind of like if the Super Mario Bros movie and Batman and Robin had a kid, and then that kid spent its whole childhood getting hit in the face with a shovel. An unusual buddy cop picture aimed at the kid crowd, Theodore Rex has gained considerable industry notoriety since its rocky inception. Scandals aside, what's finally on view is a bloated youth appeal picture with disappointing effects and a very thin story. And you heard that correctly, they did say scandals. While I will go over what makes this movie awful in a little bit here, my main fascination with Theodore Rex isn't necessarily from the movie itself, but more so from the fact that this movie has to have been one of the most unlucky and disastrous dinosaur films, and probably just films in general, I have ever heard about, and that is not an exaggeration. We're talking development hell, ruined reputations, a lawsuit, a counter lawsuit, strained relationships, several millions of dollars lost, and much more. And here's the thing, had the final product been something that was at the very least decent, or maybe something that had raked in some level of profit, then the headache that I'm going to take you through today might have, just might have been worth it, and even then, that's a bit of a stretch. But the movie was neither good nor successful, and what's sad but not surprising about all of this is that the final product was so far from what the original idea of the film was supposed to be. So I guess the best place to start this hellhole of a story is in the very beginning. The final product of the movie depicts a family-friendly comedy that partners a misfit talking dinosaur with a no-nonsense cop to solve a mystery and defeat the bad guy, whose sole purpose in this movie is world domination. In other words, by the end of its long production, this ended up being a very textbook movie, at least textbook for a 90s comedy. There isn't a lot of stakes, the violence is kept to a minimum, and by the way it was marketed, it felt like it was supposed to be a funny, good-natured, feel-good kind of movie that everyone could enjoy. But if you're at all familiar with how Hollywood runs things, it should be no surprise that the original version of this film was much different than what we ended up getting. Everything about this movie all began with a man named Jonathan Betuel. Jonathan started his writing career early, as he would write his first novel called The Dogfighter when he was 21. But this idea of being an author was short-lived. Jonathan was associated with people who were attending the New York University Film School, including his wife, 
who would bring home screenplays from her class. It would be through reading these screenplays Jonathan would develop a new interest in writing for movies rather than writing for books. Jonathan was very much into science fiction as well and wanted to find new ways to tell unique stories. This aspiration to create something new would lead him to write a screenplay for a movie called The Last Starfighter. Which to me is an absolute fever dream of a movie. I vaguely remember watching this when I was a kid and completely forgot about most of it over the years. It's crazy to think that it would pop up again randomly one day as I cover the history of another movie its creator would eventually make. The Last Starfighter didn't do well in the box office and the reception for it seemed mixed at the time. But over the years, it would form a cult following and grow in popularity based on that. Jonathan would eventually move to Hollywood and establish a name there, where he would land more work from his screenplays, this time for one called My Science Project, which would also be made into a film and was unfortunately another box office failure that didn't hold up nearly as well as The Last Starfighter even years later. But Jonathan was determined and kept working hard to think outside the box and apparently even felt ready to direct his own screenplays. At this point during the late 80s, Jonathan simply wanted to put something out there, something different and unique as he felt like movies were becoming formulaic. And so he would come up with an idea, one that would involve a talking dinosaur and a cop both put in a futuristic setting. I wanted to take something, maybe a familiar point of view, like a buddy cop movie, and shake it up in a way. Mind you, his initial vision of the film was not a kid-friendly comedy with minimal violence. While the film was still going to be a buddy cop movie, the story was meant to be a dark and gritty sci-fi epic in a world where one of the cop buddies just happens to be a dinosaur. At the time, the movie would simply go by the name of T-Rex. In fact, for the majority of the movie's production, this is what the intended name would be. Its eventual transition to Theodore Rex would be more of a last minute change, but we'll get to that later. For the beginning portion of its history, I'll be referring to the movie as its original title, T-Rex. That way I don't have to keep saying Theodore Rex over and over again. Anyways, this original version of the story was the one that Jonathan would pitch around 1989 to Richard Abramson a film producer that he met through David Snyder, who was also a producer and a film art director. Richard had his own story leading up to this movie. When he was in college, he was initially pursuing other career paths before eventually realizing his passion for film, and instead attended classes for film and radio until he was drafted into the army and sent off to Vietnam. Luckily, his film career wouldn't die there, as the army would recognize his passion and recruited him to make films for the Pentagon. Through that, he was able to travel, find stories to tell, build connections, form a film company, and finally made his way to Hollywood. There, he would actually land a job working as Pee Wee Herman's manager. And this was a title that he was best known for until he would eventually lose it through some sort of undisclosed contractual dispute. But after this loss, Richard was ready to look for something else, something to get him back into the rhythm of things. He was determined to redeem himself in the industry and making a movie seemed like a step in the right direction. After hearing Jonathan's pitch, he was hooked and wanted to be a part of the project. But almost immediately, the pair would run into their first problem, securing funding. Due to its many issues, the process of the movie's development would take about six years, six long and tedious years to get it fully completed. The reason why this was was because the movie was running on independent money, which they initially managed to secure from a man named Stefano Ferrari. Stefano has a pretty interesting background. He originally came from Italy where his father owned the largest pharmaceutical business in the country, but he wasn't interested in being in the family business, so he packed up and traveled to America where he would start a film production company and presumably this is where he would meet Richard, who he would become friendly with. Richard would then introduce him to Jonathan where the two would pitch their movie idea to him and at the time, Stefano was all for it. I have to say it was really, really a good script. Now I can guess what you're thinking, but at this stage, the script was a really gritty sci-fi story. Now, most retellings of this story that I've managed to find during my research say that Stefano Stefano would acquire $14 million from his family's wealth. 
Seeing how they run a pharmaceutical business in Italy, it would make sense for him to maybe have that kind of money. But in a more recent interview, he states this, My dad had actually cut me off years earlier because of my professional and lifestyle choices. At the time, I was living off of my wife's modeling money and the residuals from an aerobics TV show I made for Italian television. So a lot of this money was either out of pocket or borrowed from other people, but based on how Stefano regards his experience with the movie, it really did seem like he had a lot of faith in it. He had confidence in Jonathan as a director despite the fact that he wrote the screenplay for it, which is probably not the most conventional thing in the industry, but Jonathan's mindset was that if you write, then you have a responsibility to direct what you wrote. Remember this for later in the video, because this mindset would end up biting him in the ass. Anyways, at this point around 1991 I'd say, it seems that everyone was on board and on the same page with the project. But there was another problem. See, they had a certain vision about the movie. It was written a certain way around certain characters. That vision would eventually be altered as the ball was beginning to roll because eventually, production would start getting more and more expensive. More people were brought on board, more set pieces were being made, more props and resources were being used. It was simple. They needed a higher budget to accommodate for everyone and everything on set, so they wanted to get other people on board to invest in the project. But to do that, you need to prove to people that your product is going to be a success, and one component that makes a movie successful is star power. And one person that came to mind that Richard would suggest was Whoopi Goldberg, who at the time was a massive star in the industry. Having several successful films under her belt, along with several unsuccessful films, but um... We don't talk about those. Initially, the idea they had for their movie was that the one cop buddy that was going to be human was actually going to be played by a white male, someone along the lines of Kurt Russell, who could really fit into that dark, gritty tone they were looking for. But in order to acquire funds for the movie, Jonathan was willing to make some changes to the script that was more fitting for someone like Whoopi Goldberg, who's described as being funny and sassy. I rewrote the script to that because I thought the pairing of a dinosaur was still unique enough that maybe Whoopi could bring some zaniness to it, he said. Meanwhile, Richard became friendly with a man named Larry Finch, who in some sources is described as Whoopi's business partner, and in others they referred to him as her friend. But considering Whoopi would apparently owe him a six-figure sum for his work in bringing her onto the film, I'd say this was definitely more of a business partnership than anything. Either way, Larry knew her, and they managed to get in contact with her through him. They would set up a couple of meetings and get to know each other and introduce her to the project and ultimately came up with an offer for her which would end up being a five million dollar deal. Based on his account of the story, Richard recalled Whoopi thinking it was a good idea. She was on board with the project and accepted his offer, which would actually go over well in obtaining them foreign investors. While it's not entirely clear who actually invested in the film, the investors are only ever described as the Italians in interviews with the involved parties. So if I were to guess, these were probably people that Stefano was able to get in contact with, no doubt due to his connections that he probably managed to build given in his association with his father and his large pharmaceutical company. So everything was finally set. A few changes had to be made to get it done, but it was made to their satisfaction so nothing egregious had been done. They finally obtained proper funding and the team was assembled. Along with Whoopi, they would also secure other actors like Richard Roundtree and Armin Mueller Stahl, which might not mean much to us movie illiterate people who are too young to know these actors and the movies they starred in prior to T-Rex. But for for the time, these actors were pretty well known, so it was even more of a win for the production team. Some other people they managed to get on board with the project included Pond Marr, an American actor and puppeteer that would play as Teddy in the costume, as well as the voice of Teddy Rex, George Newbern, and the voice of Molly Rex, Carol Kane. Chriswell Productions was brought on board to help out with the dinosaurs, and they even got William Stout to do early concept art for it. William would take a lot of his artwork from various 
previous projects and repurposed them in a card set called Saurians and Sorcerers. And some of these cards, I think around 12 of them, were the actual concept art for Theodore Rex. And on one of these cards titled Self-Support Chamber, which depicts an early look at Elazar Kane and his caretaker inside their lab, it actually states that he had made over 60 color illustrations for the movie before leaving due to creative differences, only to come back about a year later for a brief period. In total, it looks like he made around 12 cards dedicated to the T-Rex movie, and all of the cards had some trivia on the back of them, some of them about the early days of T-Rex's pre-production phase, like how Mary Steenburgen was considered for the voice of Molly Rex, and what the early visions of Coltrane's character would have looked like, which at this point was still thought of as a white male, something that was also akin to someone like Val Kilmer, according to William. And through this art, you can tell that even though the idea was meant to be more serious and gritty this early on, there was definitely a level of corniness and humor to it, which is obvious from the James Bond spoof of Teddy Rex. I was able to find all of the card illustrations about T-Rex from William's Saurians and Sorcerers series, but I haven't had luck on finding images on the backside of all of the cards, which might give out more info regarding the early stages of T-Rex's development, nor have I been able to locate any more early concept illustrations from the movie in general, because as mentioned earlier, there were a total of about 60 made for it. Of course, if you guys have any information on this, I'd love to know. So while we're still on the topic of concept art, I actually came across, uh, well I mean more so my friend came across something very interesting that I completely overlooked during my first wave of research for this video, and that was that apparently on eBay there is this seller by the name of The Hollywood Show that is actually selling rare pieces of Theodore Rex concept art, and the thing is I don't actually know how trustworthy this Hollywood show page is. It, from the, the looks of it, it looks like it's it's pretty solid. Just scoping around their site, it looks like they're pretty well known for selling movie memorabilia and props. There's about six of these Theodore Rex concept art. By the way, uh, in case you couldn't tell, this part isn't scripted because uh, this was a last minute. <laughs> this was a last minute discovery, so I'm kind of just freeballing it uh, for the sake of, of time. Also, I refuse to give any kind of inclination that I'm at all professional at what I do here on YouTube, so... <laughs> <laughs> this is very scuffed, okay? Leave me alone. But yeah, there's like six pieces of this conceptual art uh, that are apparently from Theodore Rex, as said from the title of each of these pieces. Of course, I'm kind of looking at this through a skeptical eye because... I mean, I don't fully know. Honestly, when it comes to Theodore Rex, it's not hard to believe that certain things weren't properly archived because of the movie's history, so finding out what's authentic and what isn't is kind of difficult. But that's fine, I thought I'd just put it here anyways just to be safe, just in case there is a chance that they're real. Uh, but this site that I'm looking at seems pretty legit. Not only are they known for selling these kinds of things, but they have a pretty decent uh, positive feedback rating and they've sold thousands of these kinds of, of items. So when I saw these, I definitely wanted to include them in the video in some way. So so a couple of them include a theropod dinosaur of some kind. Uh, I'm not really sure what exactly it's supposed to be. Probably some kind of tyrannosaur, maybe something different. I'm not entirely sure. Three of them feature Parasaurolophus in different stages of age, I think. One looks like it's specifically supposed to be younger than the others. Uh, and there's one where it looks like they're in uh, underwater, maybe? I'm not entirely sure what the what the scenario is. And that's kind of why I'm questioning the authenticity of this. It almost feels like this was made for another movie. I don't really know what kind of scenario this would need to be in for a buddy cop feature, but um, whatever, I guess. It, it was a strange movie. Maybe they were going for something with that. I don't know. And the other one includes a sauropod of some kind. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. There's a total of six of these. They all go for about $100 <laughs> because I guess they're just, they're that rare. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the, these are an interesting find. I thank you to my friend Pedro who actually found them for me. I'm not even joking. We were literally on a hike when he found these. It's, it's kind of funny to be honest. But yeah, anyways, I just wanted to include these on the off chance that these could be you know, completely real. But uh, yeah, because they all have the title Theodore Rex 1995 Whoopi Goldberg Rare Conceptual Art. And then they have like S6-1, S6-2, and so on and so forth. It looks like it goes all the way up to seven but there's only six, 
meaning S6-5 is missing. So it looks like we have a little bit of lost media on our hands, unless maybe I'm overlooking even more stuff. This is all I can find. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Thanks. But I'm derailing too much. Bottom line is that the team, for the most part, was set and ready to go. What could possibly go wrong from here? Things seemed like they were going smoothly at first. Production was on its way, Richard was in the talks with Whoopi, staying in contact with her over the phone, making sure she was still committed to their project, and preparing for the eventual shooting of the movie. However, over the span of the following months, Whoopi stopped picking up the phone, and essentially ghosted Richard and everyone working on T-Rex. Considering she's supposed to be the star power for the film, her not answering anyone on set was making the team nervous, especially the investors. And there hasn't been a solid reason why Whoopi actually decided to leave this movie. Some guessed she predicted the movie's failure and decided to jump ship to avoid sinking down with it. Others assumed it was for more personal reasons. Another guess was that maybe she didn't like the idea of acting against an animatronic. According to John Jonathan, during an interview with Slasher Films How Did This Get Made, he said this, Stefano had graciously given Whoopi, who at the time was sort of betwixt the good favor of Hollywood, this landmark banner deal to which her manager slash producer then took to the studios to raise her price and get her a three picture deal. I don't blame her for that really, but it got to the point where Stefano was still paying holding money on the vast amount of money that was set aside. And Whoopi's people, they basically said, We know you paid this, Stefano, and we'll give you your money back, but if you're looking for anything more than that, then sue us. Not in so many words, but that was the crux of it. The thing is, Stefano and Richard didn't want to sue Whoopi, because not only is she a powerful figure in Hollywood, meaning they'd most likely lose anyways, but suing a huge and lovable movie star like her at the time would have tarnished their reputations. And initially, they weren't planning on doing that from the sounds of it. Because according to Stefano, Whoopi actually approached him and Richard to try to work out a deal. If they let her go from the project, she would agree to help them with it in other ways. Like maybe being an executive producer and using her star power to get them a good actor or actress, which based on what I've read, Stefano was all for this idea. However, Richard wasn't. The Italian said, you gotta find a way to get her to do it. So I was basically following the wishes of the people who had financed the film, according to Richard in an interview. You see, the whole point of getting Whoopi on board was to get more investors interested in financing the film. They succeeded in doing that, but now that she was attempting to back out of the project, the investors are obviously not happy about this. So they either wanted her to be in the film so that they can make back the money they invested into it, or they were going to sue her for $20 million for breaching her contract by trying to back out of the film she agreed to be a part of. Not wanting to anger the people giving them money and jeopardize their movie, Richard and Stefano were essentially pressured into moving forward with the lawsuit, marking a point in the film's production history that Stefano especially thought would be one of its biggest downfalls. In 1993, the issue was taken to court. Whoopi tried to defend her stance by saying she never formally agreed to be in the film, whereas the opposing party says otherwise. And this presents a big issue with this lawsuit. You see, no contract was ever made for this deal, so it boiled down to a he said, she said kind of case, which in court was going to be a long and tedious process for both parties to figure out who's in the right and who's in the wrong. As you can likely already imagine, Whoopi wasn't too happy about getting sued, and actually attempted to countersue Richard for it. According to some rumors, she countersued to try and get more money than what she was initially offered, but some speculated she did this in the hopes that the producers would just let her go from the project completely. But as you can tell from the length of this video, that didn't end up happening. Because everything all came to a head when Richard provided a very crucial piece of evidence regarding Whoopi's commitment to the film. Apparently, during one of the calls that Richard made to Whoopi early on when they were still in contact, his answering machine had actually recorded their conversation. 
in this recording when Richard asks Whoopi specifically if she was still committed to the T-Rex film, she clearly said yes, providing more than enough evidence to prove that Whoopi did in fact agree to be in the movie. Of course, there was a counterattack, with Whoopi's lawyer trying to argue that the conversation was recorded illegally because it was recorded without Whoopi's knowledge. So the court ordered a third-party recording expert to give their opinion on the matter, who would end up stating that the call was actually recorded well within legal boundaries. Meaning, Whoopi was fucked. In fact, the judge who was running this case, Lester E. Olson, would suggest for Whoopi to settle, as there was a strong chance she was going to be losing this case. By the way, fun fact, now retired Los Angeles judge Lester E. Olson was actually given a spot in the movie's credits for his efforts in bringing the involved parties to a settlement, which I thought was funny and wanted to include in the video. Anyways, Whoopi didn't want to go down without a fight, so instead of settling, the two parties went into a period of mediation sessions, which basically meant that each party were in their own rooms in the courthouse talking to their attorneys to decide what they wanted to do next, and a mediator would be there to obtain all the information from one party and go to the other to relay that same information. And because this is a movie producer and a movie actress we're talking about here, they're obviously busy people. They had projects and jobs to get to during the day, so these mediation sessions had to take place during the evening, and they would last for hours, all the way to like 2 in the morning. And for almost nothing, because neither parties were getting anywhere with this method. It got to a point where Richard was getting tired of these sessions, and suggested one day that he just sit with Whoopi herself to try and work something out professionally. At first, Whoopi refused. She was just very angry about this entire situation, understandably. I can't imagine anyone liking being sued, but she was advised by her lawyers to do so anyways. So it was arranged for them to set up a meeting together where Richard and Whoopi could talk face to face without any interference from anyone. The only other people in the room with them were their attorneys, but they were supposed to keep quiet while Richard and Whoopi worked out the problem. And what's funny about this is that the first thing Whoopi says to Richard when they sit down together is, Just for the record, I hate your guts. Maybe in 10 years you and I can have a cup of coffee and laugh about this, but you've made my life a living hell and I hate your fucking guts. And Richard kind of just took these words to the chin. According to his version of the story, he told Whoopi that he completely understood her anger, but that he was put in a shitty situation as well, and that they should just try to figure something out. Richard asked Whoopi that if they offered more money, would that be enough for her to star in the film, to which she didn't necessarily say no to, but she was hesitant in accepting any offers. The two got to talking, and as expected, this went on for a while, to the point where the Italian investors who were overseas were awake at this point and were willing to get on call to give their input on the deal. In the end, Richard and the investors would offer Whoopi $2 million more on top of her already $5 million offer if she agreed to star in the movie. And I mean, from Whoopi's perspective, there really was no other choice. If she settled, she'd have to pay them a lot more money. But if she did the film and endured the struggle for those several months of production, she could at least get money out of it. She definitely didn't like being put in this situation, but out of the two options, she picked the obvious one under a couple of conditions. That being, she wanted Richard and Stefano banned from the set, as she just really didn't like them at all given how the events unfolded. So this was the deal that was settled on, and honestly, at this point of the movie's production, things were kind of falling apart. People started losing confidence in each other, and things were very tense. Not only was Whoopi mad at Richard and Stefano to the point where they weren't even allowed on set anymore, but some accounts also reported that she she was very angry with her business partner Larry Finch, probably for getting her into this movie in the first place, but now these two are at a point where they aren't even on speaking terms anymore. Though I will say there were a lot of things that happened that haven't been documented or talked about, so if I were to guess, there's more to their story than just that, but I can only work with what I have. 
Along with Whoopi, the investors were also mad at Richard because they didn't like that the situation escalated to this point, even though they pushed him to do it. Since Richard and Stefano weren't really allowed on set when Whoopi was there, which was pretty much all the time since she was the star of the movie, the two went their separate ways. Around this point, Richard had lost his faith in Jonathan as a director, as Jonathan made plenty of his own mistakes throughout the production that we'll get into in a bit here. Overall, it was a shit show that would only get shittier during the rest of the film's production phase. The development of T-Rex was not a pleasant one. There were so many problems that ranged from minor things like technical errors with the animatronics and filming during cold nights in LA, to Whoopi being very unpleasant on set and Jonathan constantly changing things on the script, which would only further stress everyone out. As far as Whoopi goes, there was a point during the pre-production phase when Stefano did show up on set one day. It's not specified why, but it didn't seem like it was to cause any problems or go against Whoopi's conditions or anything like that. He probably just needed to get some affairs in order before he stepped out of the set indefinitely. But on his way out of one of the offices, he would walk past Whoopi, which was probably very awkward. But he simply said hello to her. She did not respond with the hello back, but instead she muttered the word motherfucker under her breath, but clearly loud enough for him to hear it. Yeah, did I mention Whoopi wasn't very happy with these guys? Along with this, she was also said to not be very easy to work with either, at least at first. She would make certain demands to Jonathan about the movie that he would turn down. She was always in a pissy mood when she first started, which I get it, she's essentially being forced to star in this movie. It's understandable she'd be pretty upset by that. And there was at least one incident where she yelled at one of the special effects people working on the animatronics. So before I continue, I realized reading back on this script, it almost feels like I'm demonizing Whoopi in this entire situation. And I just want to point out that that's not at all my intentions with this. The reason why it may sound like that is because since the film was released, Jonathan, Richard, and Stefano, among a few others, have come out to give their stories of the events that took place, and for the most part, they seem over it and just want to move on from it. But at the same time, they've owned up to the mess their film was and were bold enough to talk about it in detail in interviews all these years later. Okay, maybe that's not the right way of putting it because I feel like that statement implies that Whoopi is a coward for not talking about her experiences, which is totally within her right. I'm not saying that she has to to not be a coward or anything. I'm just I'm just saying these guys could have easily just ignored everything. They could have completely forgotten about this film and refused to do any kind of interviews or answer anybody's questions. Yet they did. And that's in my opinion, kind of respectable because this is just not a film that if I made, I, I probably wouldn't want to be talking about it. So at the same time, I don't blame Whoopi for not wanting to talk about it. Like everyone else, she too was ashamed of being associated with this film, and refuses to talk about her experience with it in depth with anyone. Sometimes during interviews, she doesn't even say the name of the movie, but still hints that it was her least favorite role to star for. And as a result, the only things I have to work off of in terms of anyone's personal experiences with the film are primarily from Jonathan, Stefano, and Richard. So I'm able to get the story from their points of view. That being said, Whoopi did have a sort of redemption arc, a little character development, if you will. During that one incident where she yelled at the special effects guy whose name is Bruce Lenoyle. Bruce is an American puppeteer and voice actor who isn't at all a stranger to the film or television industry, and he was brought onto the project by Pons Marr, the man who actually played in the Theodore Rex costume. Despite this, Theodore Rex was definitely a challenging film to work on in terms of the special effects. I don't know for sure, take this information with a grain of salt, but according to IMDB's Theodore Rex trivia page, there were a total of 28 dinosaur animatronics used in the movie. And to put that into perspective of how just chaotic that sounds, keep in mind with just one dinosaur animatronic, there were a lot of things to consider when it came to moving it around on set. 
For example, many set pieces had to be placed far away from each other to account for Theodore's long-ass tail, which, funnily enough, is actually a running gag in the movie of his tail just slapping a bunch of shit. Then of course you had all of the accessories and props that had to be made specifically for Theodore Rex, like his attire, furniture. They even had a whole vehicle made specifically for Theodore. Not to mention the weathering conditions the animatronics had to be in when the cameras rolled, which for the first month of filming was sometimes during the late and very cold LA nights which would cause some technical issues. So if there was that much to consider for one dinosaur, imagine the stress these guys had to endure with almost 30 of them. Even if that number isn't accurate, you can tell just by watching the movie that there were a lot of animatronics they were working with. And if you thought the stress of managing all of these animatronics wasn't enough, Bruce also mentioned an incident of corporate espionage, where someone from a rival puppet builder company attempted to spy on some of the practical effects products the team was working on for the movie and took pictures of them. I wish I could give more information on this because it does sound kind of interesting, but by the way Bruce talks about it, this event seems like it was more of a minor inconvenience than anything. But still, it's crazy to think just the amount of bullshit they had to deal with for this movie. So yeah, Bruce and his team had their work cut out for them, and it especially didn't help when they were berated by an impatient Whoopi. On the first day of shooting when the Theodore Rex head wasn't working properly, Bruce was ready to just call it a night, but was told by the producer that he had to keep working on it as this first day of shooting would make or break the future of this movie. So every moment of filming was crucial. So under this pressure, Bruce continues to work on it now worried about losing his job, before Whoopi, who's clearly in a bad mood, confronts him and angrily says, is this fucking thing gonna work? Bruce simply responds with, we're trying, before Whoopi caps off this brief interaction with, it better, and storms off. As cruel as this sounds, Bruce did say that once things got going again, Whoopi seemed to have come around to being more bearable to work with. And she even talked to him again after the incident and the two got to know each other. And in a completely unexpected turn of events, when she saw that Bruce was working in an old rundown trailer, she would go out of her way to get him a newer and better one. According to Bruce during an interview, he says that she would kind of take him under her wing and the two would end up becoming great friends. And that she was even amazing to his family when they would come to visit him at work. And it wasn't just him, he also said that she became friendly and uplifting and professional to her co-workers as well and ended up bringing people together making the most out of this bad situation. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad we were able to get a little wholesome moment in there with this mess of a movie production. But that's too much wholesomeness, let's get back to the shitty stuff. Jonathan Betuel was not a good director for Theodore Rex. There were several instances where people behind the scenes complained about the choices Jonathan would make for the film. He would constantly change the script, sometimes during filming, he'd want to do new things for different sets, he was constantly worrying and second guessing himself, sometimes he just wasn't satisfied with things and would change or try to change them on a whim. When it came to the script, he would rewrite certain dialogue and parts and have Bruce send them off to the actors, who would now have these new sets of lines to practice after already getting their previous ones down which only added to the stress that was already encompassing the entire set. There was one point after Bruce dropped off the lines for the millionth time where one of the actors, Armin Mueller Stahl, the man who would play the villain Elazar Kane, would tell him, Hey Bruce, how about we try the lines as they were written for once, please? According to another piece of trivia on IMDb, take it with a grain of salt, Whoopi said the crew members were coming and going and that by the time they reached the final day of shooting, 99% of the crew was different from the first day. I have no idea how true that is as I wasn't able to find her saying this on any other source, but I wouldn't doubt that some people probably got fed up enough with the work conditions to the point where they just quit, but I feel like 99% might be an exaggeration. I don't don't know. Whoopi was also annoyed with Jonathan at times, which partly stemmed from their different creative approaches. Whoopi definitely had more confidence and was a good communicator, whereas Jonathan was more reserved and wanted to figure out things on his own. And the clashing of these two methods only made things harder for the team. 
Stefano had said during an interview that they didn't always get along and that they had creative differences, which would continue to add tension on the set. Of course, he has limited account of what things were like on set, but this is what he did know about it. According to the movie's production designer, Walter Martitius, Jonathan was great. He was a great conceptual thinker and really had a vision for how to make this film stand out. But the thing that would occasionally become frustrating with Jonathan was that whenever we were halfway through something, he would tend to get a fresh idea and say, hey, why don't we do this instead? Let's change this and this and this. And since, you know, it takes weeks or months to design a particular set, I'd have to kind of talk him down. We were under the gun and just didn't have the time, so I'd wound up saying something like, of those five things you want, like maybe he'd seen them done in a movie he watched over the weekend, what's your favorite thing? Pick one thing and maybe there's enough time to do that. Otherwise, I really enjoyed working with him. Despite the struggle with Jonathan's never-ending desire for constant change for a movie that was gearing up to not even be that good anyways, Walter managed to put together some pretty decent sets for it at least in my opinion. Despite all of the issues and hardships everyone endured, the entire production would finally wrap up. Unfortunately, the film's long streak of bad luck would continue well past this point. This movie could not catch a break, because even after post-production, there were still a plethora of issues that would follow. The movie was $300,000 over budget, New Line was already requesting certain changes to be made for it, and by the time the film was finally finished, they were too late in terms of the special effects department. Technical achievements in CGI had already been made, rendering certain practical effects like animatronics somewhat outdated. At one point, Stefano literally said, I remember going to Kane's and seeing the premiere for a movie called Dragonheart, which used CGI. And I remember sitting there in the audience and saying to myself, we're fucked. But these were just a few issues, with the main one stemming from the film's overall reception. The film would have test screenings in select locations where it would end up failing in most, if not all of them, including Nevada, Maine, Tennessee, and Rhode Island. Regarding New Line wanting a bunch of changes, they wanted the violent parts cut out along with some of the dinosaur dialogue to be rewritten to give better explanation for the plot of the movie, making it very clear that they were trying really hard to just make this movie as kid-friendly as possible to push towards a wider range demographic. But even after doing this, screenings for the film were still met with poor reception. Which isn't what Jonathan thought because according to him, he was told the test screenings went well. It would also be around this time where New Line would change the name of the movie from T-Rex to Theodore Rex. Probably to give it a bit more personality, which would make sense considering they were clearly trying to aim it more towards kids. On top of all of this, the movie's release date would get pushed back a couple of times. From what I can gather, the original theatrical release of the film was going to be on Thanksgiving of 1995, but was pushed back to Christmas of 1995 before there were talks of pushing it to March of 1996, as the studio wanted its release to coincide with the 1996 Academy Awards ceremony because Whoopi was invited to host it. It would have been a golden opportunity to get a cool ass shout out for the movie, but in the end, the movie wouldn't get any theatrical release at all, at least not in the States. After the poor reception from test screenings, New Line decided to cut their losses and release the movie direct to video instead of in theaters. This is further confirmed by New Line's head of marketing, Mitch Goldman, who said, In the end, the print and advertising investment for a theatrical run seemed greater than the box office promise. We're fans of Whoopies, but felt that this isn't the right movie to grab her audience's attention. It would be irresponsible for our owners to throw money down the drain. For the time, Theodore Rex held the title for being the most expensive direct-to-video movie, costing a grand total of $33.5 million. This has changed in recent times, but it's still up there as one of the most expensive ones. Despite this, New Line had sold the distribution rights to a foreign films distributor company called J&M Entertainment. 
whose plan was to sell the movie theatrically overseas. Theodore Rex would actually be played in theaters internationally in places like Spain, Germany, Japan, and so on. In places like Germany, it wouldn't perform well, but it did pretty decent in other places like Spain. For Japan, they even did this fun little promotional event where they did a live tour with the actual Theodore Rex animatronic. And while I was able to find this Japanese poster for the movie, which is still titled T-Rex in some places overseas, I wasn't able to find any pictures or videos of this live tour with the actual Theodore Rex animatronic. But I'm interested to see any kind of proof of this. If you guys have any more info about it, let me know. Anyways, the only places where the movie didn't get wide theatrical releases on J&M Entertainment's list was Italy, Canada, and the United States. As far as the reception goes for this movie, I mean, do I really need to say it? People didn't like it. The movie was not only a financial bomb, but also a critical one as well. People criticized it for its obviously terrible aspects like its dialogue, the acting, and the poor attempts at being comedic. A violin. And a dragon. That's Tyrannosaurus Rex, girly boy. They also criticized the special effects, which honestly, at this point in time, was a very easy thing to judge considering just a couple years prior, Jurassic Park had been released, which is one of the kings of technical achievements when it comes to the blending of CGI and practical effects. I feel like when I see reviews of Theodore Rex and people criticize the practical stuff, it's almost as if they act like the use of practical effects suddenly stopped after Jurassic Park was released, when it's still being used a lot even to this day. And yeah, these animatronics aren't winning any awards, and they do have their moments in the film where they do look very cursed and unintentionally hilarious, but I'd argue this was probably one of the better aspects of the movie, just knowing the sheer amount of work that went into creating and working these dinosaurs, which I'll admit feels wasted for a film like this. But again, it's one of the better parts of it. Regardless of what I think, the bottom line here is that the film was poorly received, before, during, and after its release. To put it simply, the movie had failed. But it's been 28 years since its release. A lot of time has been given to people to get used to the movie, and maybe even look past some of its imperfections, to appreciate some of the things it did right, and I'm just kidding, I already stated in the beginning of this video that I think the movie is pretty bad. But to further emphasize what I mean, I want to quickly go through through the movie itself. That and I revel in putting my fans through the same pain that I have to go through to make these videos. Anyways, let's take a quick look at Theodore Rex to see what made it such a piece of shit aside from all of the behind the scenes drama. Theodore Rex starts off with scrolling text that pretty much spoils the entire movie, giving away that Elazar Kane is the man behind all of the evil schemes you're going to see for the next 90 minutes, and whose master plan is to destroy Earth with a missile so that he can cause another Ice Age, where he then plans to reanimate and release animals he has kept frozen in his Ark so that he can create a new paradise that he envisions, I guess. Along with that, we're introduced to this dude, whose name is Edge, because he is one edgy man. At least he looks edgy as fuck. Anyways, Edge literally bombs a dinosaur, and the scene cuts to Teddy Rex, a public relations officer whose dream is to become a detective. Which I guess is not a very common thing in this world, because dinosaurs are kind of sort of treated as lesser, because believe it or not, the movie kind of sort of takes this concept of anthropomorphic dinosaurs living alongside people, and very loosely makes some sort of commentary on racism, or social classes, or something of the like, because the moral of the story is that no matter how different different you may look, you can achieve anything. But as you can already imagine, any elements of those ideas get completely lost in translation with this movie. I wouldn't doubt they probably wanted to explore something like that in the early stages of the film's development, considering it was meant to have a darker tone than what we were given. But as I mentioned before, the script was changed a lot and certain scenes were cut, so now this concept might as well be non-existent. We're also introduced to Katie Coltrane, a badass half human, half-cyborg detective who waits and watches a truckload of goons shoot down a man before interfering. 
Her and her partner end up crashing the truck, which blows up a good chunk of the movie's budget. While Katie is doing a terrible job as a detective, Teddy visits the commissioner at a fundraiser thrown together by Elazar Kane. You know, the guy who's the bad guy who isn't acting like the bad guy because we shouldn't know he's a bad guy, but we already do know he's a bad guy because the movie tells us he's the bad guy. But let's be honest, he has an archetype very much akin to bad guys in these movies, so I think it's safe to say that Kane is in fact the bad guy. Also, he's responsible for the creation of all the dinosaurs that now live alongside them in this society. Anyways, Teddy begs the commissioner to let him solve the dead dinosaur case, which in this movie is called a dinocide. And eventually, he lets him, because if Teddy can actually pull this off, the commissioner can bask in all the glory, I guess. But hey, what do you know? Teddy is teamed up with Katie, much to her dismay, because she's racist. It's a dinosaur! You're not a species, are you? Or a speciest. I, I don't know. Let's not think too hard about it. Anyways, they go to look at the dead dinosaur body and manage to identify him, where they find out he's associated with another dinosaur character named Molly Rex. And god damn it, if this movie wasn't already painful enough to watch, pretty much any scene with Teddy and Molly make you want to break the Geneva Convention. Molly works at a nightclub as a singer, and as she's doing her number, Teddy is practically orgasming over her fucking voice. I don't care how you do it, babe, just so you please. Meanwhile, some troll face looking ass ceratosaur over here is trying to riz up Katie, but gets brutally rejected. And you think you're gonna get somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Not tonight, baby. <laughs> The two meet up again and finally get Molly alone to talk to her about what she knows. I mean, at least Katie is. Teddy is too busy simping hard for Molly. But it's just so fucking weird because as she walks away to go change real quick, Teddy literally says this. Don't bruise the taffeta. <laughs> Wide Whoa. load coming through. <laughs> Ooh, shouldn't have said that, sorry. They get their info, leave, and part ways for the night. But Teddy's attacked by the goons from earlier, and they destroy his vehicle. So the next day, they go in to get Teddy a new vehicle and a new look. After all, he's working undercover. He's got to blend in, right? Ella, this is not undercover. Push the button. Mexican, more like Rexican. I don't, I don't know how I do it. I, I just, I don't know how I do it. I am so fucking funny. They get their new vehicle, which is a garbage truck because this movie is garbage, obviously. And they make a quick stop to visit one of Katie's friends where Teddy says some sus shit, not gonna lie. May I have three balls at the same time, please? Whoa. Whoa indeed, I didn't think he swung that way. After they leave, the kid gets kidnapped by the goons. Also, Katie found out earlier that the unidentified human body was a man who worked for Kane at his company, New Eden. So they go pay him a quick visit, but they don't really go anywhere with it. They then attend the funeral for the dinosaur that was killed, where Molly asks Teddy for a walk home. But get this, he takes her to his house, where he shows her his toy car collection. That's not even really a joke, that's one of the things he fucking says. You want to see my car collection, Molly? I've got some really nice ones. <laughs> Love him or hate him, this dinosaur has his priorities straight. Yeah, also, I don't really want to go over the very cringe dance scene that plays out, so I'm just gonna... It's gonna skip over that. But duty calls and he has to get back to work. So they go back to headquarters where they find that a piece of the bomb that killed the dinosaur belonged to a butterfly replica created by someone called the Toy Maker. So they go pay him a visit and the weirdest scene in the movie, if you can believe that or not, plays out. This random puppet guy who isn't previously established in any way pops out from a bag on the counter. But what makes this even weirder is that Katie and Teddy are not bothered at all by this very weird encounter. To them, they talk to it as if it was just another Tuesday. I want to know where the toy maker is, and my friend here is going to bite your pee. Whoa, 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 Katie, you can't say that in a kid's film. As if this scene didn't feel random and out of place already, this worm thing comes out of nowhere, turns into a butterfly, and directs them to the toy maker. Also, for some reason, the movie resorts to making a bunch of fart jokes in the second half. I guess Teddy is so nervous he can't help himself. When they finally encounter the toy maker, he kind of already suspects what's going on and hits them with a bomb before dipping. But somehow, the explosion doesn't kill any of them despite how big it was and they're able to catch and interrogate the toy maker. Teddy burps and farts on him until he gives up useful information and then they crash into Kane's building because that was a great idea. 
And this is where Kane fills Teddy in on his master plan to take over the world and play God because he wants to control evolution or some shit like that. Anyways, Kane and Edge leave, and this dumb bitch is like, I'll just walk over here to this chamber where I'm supposed to put the T-Rex in so that we can freeze him. Surely I'm not jeopardizing my mission by positioning myself in the exact spot where he can so easily whack me inside the chamber with his tail, oh darn. Oh yeah, Molly Rex is also stuck inside one of these chambers because she got kidnapped earlier. And all it took to get her out was slapping the control pad, because who cares about trying at this point? I'm not even joking, the rest of this movie is actually very rushed. We have seven minutes of the film left before the credits roll, and in that span of time, Katie gets shot and is partly disabled because remember, she's part robot. Teddy also gets shot, but it's okay because Katie gives him a quick pep talk about how he can stop the bad guys without using a gun instead of just, you know, giving him her fucking gun. But it doesn't matter, because he takes his pep talk to heart, goes after the bad guys manages to take out one of the goons who was carrying a decently sized gun that he ditches because of Katie's stupid words, grabs rope and a metal bar instead, makes a hook out of it, throws it at Kane's truck and hooks it onto his seat, captures him while the truck is still rolling which goes right into a sign and fucking blows up for no reason killing Edge, grabs the remote from Kane without any real struggle and detonates the missile while it's still out in space, abruptly ending the final conflict of the film and cutting to a ceremony celebrating celebrating Teddy and Katie. Teddy is promoted to detective, he gets the girl, and picks Katie to be his permanent partner, and I kid you not, the last minute and a half of this film, everyone in the background continues their annoyingly endless clapping as these two are finishing things up, which I only noticed because I watched this movie like three or four fucking times for this video. I am not exaggerating when I say almost everything about this movie is garbage. I enjoyed this movie the first time watching it through because a lot of the scenes were so absurd and unintentionally funny to me. But imagine watching that more than two or three times, it gets old pretty fast. The movie randomly introduces things that feel completely out of place or shoehorned in, which is likely the result of the constant change the film had gone through during production, not to mention the changes it was forced to go through after post-production. By the end, we're left with this, a very messy film. That being said, I will give it this. There were some interesting aspects to the dinosaurs' culture and practices, like at the funeral scene. How the dinosaurs liquefy dead bodies so that they can be poured into flower pots that are then given to guests, which actually kind of makes sense, because in this world, the dinosaurs are all kind of one big family. Because they all share a common creator, that being Cain, so none of them have true parents or a family unit in the same sense as humans do, so they run things a bit differently. The impression I get from my research on the early days of the film, it didn't seem like there was ever going to be an in-depth look at the dinosaur's culture or reasoning behind their presence in the modern world. So it makes sense that that was all kept pretty simple by the time they got around to making the actual movie. Along with that, I also still think the animatronics aren't terrible. Not great, but they aren't that bad either. At first, I didn't like the looks of them, but since I've started this video, they've grown on me. What can I say? Alright, those are my thoughts on why I think this movie was bad, which isn't much because I pretty much agree with most of the other people's opinions on it. But, believe it or not, things are still not over for the people behind Theodore Rex. Because the aftermath of the film ended up doing a lot of damage. When it was announced the film was not going to be released in theaters, Jonathan was surprised and very disappointed to hear about the change. This movie would end up affecting his filmmaking career as it would be the last one he would direct. In a more recent interview, he mentioned that he's admittedly forgotten about a lot of the development phase of the film, not because he's trying to avoid questions, but because he's genuinely just trying to suppress bad memories from that point in time. He would go on to state that the reason why he hasn't made another film after Theodore Rex was because the process in obtaining independent money ended up being a very long and tedious process that left a very bad taste in his mouth. But this wouldn't actually be the end of Jonathan's career in the entertainment business because he would also go on to create a special effects company called Luma Pictures, who've taken on some pretty big VFX projects with the MCU and movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, No Country for Old Men, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and so on. 
He did seem to have some legal troubles with the company for a little bit there around 2019, but from what it looks like today, he still works with them and is even considering going back to do some work in the film industry again with a possible sequel for The Last Starfighter. Jonathan seemed to have gotten off pretty easy from this experience, especially compared to Stefano, who was hit with very bad news around the same time New Line announced the film wasn't going to be released in theaters. On top of that, a greater tragedy in his personal life would come up, as his father would end up passing away. Unfortunately for Stefano, this wouldn't be the end of his bad luck, as the outcome of the film would leave him in debt with a lot of people, not to mention his other legal hardships. Apparently, there was a point before the film's production where Richard's ex-wife Maria Dillon was allegedly promised a line producer job and when things fell through, she went after Stefano in an $80,000 suit. There were still legal fees to his attorney that needed to be paid from the Goldberg lawsuit which came out to around $100,000. Somewhere in there, one of Richard's associates that was also a producer, Tommy Yanez Ferrari, a name that I haven't heard or seen anywhere near the Theodore Rex film, and by the way, no, he shares no relation to Stefano, apparently sued for copyright infringement because he claimed he owned the rights to the movie and managed to get $400,000 out of the suit. Along with that, a complaint was filed to Stefano by City National Bank for an unpaid loan which also came out to around $400,000. If that wasn't bad enough, J&M Entertainment went after Stefano in a lawsuit as well to try and recoup their investment into the film, although I don't know how how much they ended up getting out of him if they even won this case at all. And finally, he had to repay all of the investors that financed the film and according to Jonathan, who just felt awful that Stefano was targeted so heavily, Stefano paid back every penny to at least the investors for sure to leave no loose ends. It became pretty clear that the reason why people were going after Stefano was because he had the deepest pockets, as described in the interviews. After this, Stefano would end up going back to the pharmaceutical business where, to my knowledge, he still works at to this day. But no matter what, his name will always be attached to this project. However, his name is not the only thing attached to the movie. If you look back at the credits, you'll see that they managed to edit in a small dedication segment for Stefano's late father, Lorenzo Ferrari, which honestly is kind of nice. For Richard, he was just so done with this project, he admitted that he meant to take his name off of it before it was released, but never got a chance to. His career in filmmaking, from what I've seen, had pretty much gone downhill from here. He did work on a couple of different movie projects here and there as a producer, but nothing that skyrocketed him back into the mainstream film industry. It's hard to tell what he's doing nowadays, but according to the one interview he did, he stated that he attempted to watch Theodore Rex once. However, he didn't finish it, because to him, it's an unwatchable film. Shortly after the film's release, he would state, Life is too short, the budget was tight, relationships were strained, and I had second thoughts about going into the situation with an unhappy star. He also said that this was an interesting point in his life and that it was a good story. And I can actually agree with him on that. Despite the hardships these guys went through for this movie, in the end, it does tell a very interesting story. And of course, there's Whoopi, who from what's implied, pretty much just left the set as soon as all her filming duties were completed. She didn't stay for any kind of marketing support for the film because why would she? She already despised being in the film, there was no way she would want to do anything that would promote it, and when it came to the film's release date being pushed back, people actually speculated that it was at the request of Whoopi herself in a possible attempt to bury the film. But that's all that really was, just speculation. But after the film's release, Whoopi would end up being nominated for a Razzie Award for her performance on Theodore Rex. For those of you that don't know, a Razzie Award is a parody award that's meant to honor those that have contributed to cinema in the worst ways. And for Whoopi Goldberg, she was nominated for Worst Actress from her role in Theodore Rex in 1996. But she would end up losing to another actress. And what's funny about this is that this was wasn't the first time Whoopi was nominated for a Razzie. 
She had also been nominated for one in 1998, but lost to another actress as well. I like how I keep saying lost as if she wanted the award. What's even funnier about this whole thing is that Whoopi was actually one of the few actors that was at EGOT award status. Which basically means she's one of the few people that have gotten all of the major arts awards in America, including an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony award. And twice, she almost turned that status from an EGOT to a REGOT with the Razzie Award. Considering just how high profile Whoopi is compared to the rest of the people in this story, it's easy to see what she's doing nowadays. She still maintained a pretty successful career as an actress even to this day, along with being a host on The View, so she's not doing too bad. Aside from all of the weird takes she's had on that show, but you know, we don't talk about that. However, like I mentioned earlier in the video, unlike the film makers, Whoopi isn't very open to talking about Theodore Rex. And there are very few interviews out there where she actually talks about the film at all, but every now and then she will be asked about it. But when she is asked about it, she never goes in detail about her experiences. She only briefly mentions it. She is pretty open to state her disdain for the movie, but what's funnier about these interviews is that she is so ashamed of Theodore Rex, she doesn't even mention the name of the movie when it's brought up. I only made one movie I regret. I can say it had a talking dinosaur. I guess that says it all, right? Don't ask me why I did it, I didn't want to. Even as recent as 2021 when she talked about the movie on The View, she barely goes into any detail about it, only saying, There is no movie that makes no sense to anyone but people love it. It's about my relationship as a police officer with a talking dinosaur. As far as first-hand accounts go with Theodore Rex, not many people outside of the main four I've talked about throughout this video have gone into any detail about their time working on the movie, save for maybe a few of them. Going back to Whoopi's business partner Larry Finch, he states for the LA Times, this was the worst deal in which I've ever been involved. There's nothing entertaining about the entertainment business. This could have been a beautiful kid's picture, but it turned. It just turned. No Nobody gave their all except in screwing each other, so a lot of people got used and abused. I try to put the experience out of mind, but it keeps coming back like a bad dream. Walter Martitius, the movie's production designer, didn't think anyone even knew this movie existed, probably assuming it would just end up being forgotten and ditched. Not to mention working on this movie had left him a very bad impression of Whoopi given how bad she was on set sometimes. To the point where Walter admits he has to switch the channel every time he sees Whoopi on TV nowadays. And there's also William Stout, who was asked during an interview with Michael McCarty on his website, Monster Mikey author, which movie he was least satisfied with. Easy, he said, Theodore Rex, the most expensive direct-to-video movie ever made. To give you an idea how wrong this film was, it starred Whoopi Goldberg in the part written for Val Kilmer. I was the movie's production designer for the first nine months of pre-production. It was the only film I ever walked away from. Leaving that film is one of the reasons I'm still alive. Jesus, that's depressing. You know, with the constant struggles, broken dreams, and disastrous outcomes regarding this movie, I think it's safe to say that this video was largely depressing. So I want to end things off on a good note. There's another person who gave their story with their time working on Theodore Rex, that being Bruce Lenoil. As far as Bruce goes, he would end up having a pretty successful career in the film industry, providing his voice acting and puppetry skills in a wide range of projects. And he's one of the few people that talked a bit about his experience working on Theodore Rex and what he thought about the movie. As you'd expect, he thinks it's as bad as everyone else does and even says that it's so bad that he had a hard time watching it. But this was one of the first films he worked on as a practical effects performer, so for him at the time, it was a good opportunity. I managed to find a couple of interviews from smaller channels where he talks about that incident where he was yelled at by Whoopi, which made him a bit worried for his career in the film industry because, again, this was his first movie that he was working on in terms of practical effects work, and it was already just not going so well for him. Like right after you did Dinosaurs or probably right towards the end, uh, so you were Theodore Rex. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we came off of that and thought, oh, you know, let's uh, let's do this. And uh, oh boy, here's the beginning of that movie. 
so, you know, we get to set, and for some reason, this everything's going wrong. It turns out our dinosaur just wasn't working on the, on the first day of shooting. All I had was an eyebrow. So I'm just, I'm wiggling an eyebrow for all I'm worth, thinking, <laughs> oh, my God, this is the end of my career. And Whoopi looks right at camera, and she said, is this, you know, beep, beep, thing going to work? And she's just yelling at me. And I said, I, I, I didn't know what to say because I, I just did uh, nothing I could do. And I had a little, you know, tiny dressing room, this, you know, this stinky little dressing room. And I just curled up <laughs> in a fetal ball saying, well, that's my career. But it turns out Whoopi kind of things started working better and she, she made the best of it. And she was she was so loving and kind and, and made the best of it. And it, it, it is so hard to watch that movie. It is so bad. <laughs> and uh, I, I got to work with Whoopi a couple more times. And so, oh, really? It, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a real blessing to have her weave through. She, was, she played God in um, a Monkey Bone. Uh, she did a Muppet, uh, Muppets Tonight, if you remember. Uh, she, she did a guest star role. And she was so sweet to me. I wasn't allowed at the reening, and it was a little political. And she said, Bruce, and she gave me a big hug in front of Frank Oz, and Frank's mouth just dropped open. Because how do you know Whoopi? I said, she was my she, you know, little co-stars. That's how I know Whoopi. And this wouldn't be the last time these two would work together. They would work on a couple of other movies, and during that time, Bruce and Whoopi maintained their friendship. So if I'm going to end this video off on anything, this very long video about one of the most ill-conceived, unlucky, and expensively disastrous dinosaur films, and maybe even just films in general in the world that nobody, not even the people who worked on it, liked, it's going to be on one of the few good things that came out of it, a friendship between an unlikely pair in the entertainment industry. Thank you all so much for watching. Well, that took, um... A, a long time, a lot longer than I was uh, expecting that to. Initially, when I came up with this uh, this idea to do this video, it was just gonna be like more of a of a a quick list kind of video, just kind of going through all of the reasons why this movie was shit. But as I did more and more research for it, it slowly became this very story heavy video about <laughs> the entire history of Theodore Rex and how it came to be because it's just it was just too interesting to not make it like this. <laughs> so, if you've if you made it this far to the video, thank you so much for watching. It means a lot, truly. Uh the video that you are watching that's playing over this voiceover is uh, a speed paint or a speed draw of the Theodore Rex PNG that I used for the thumbnail that was made by my friend Gambit. So I just want to give a quick thanks to Gambit for making that for me. It came out really nice. I'm glad it uh, it captures all of uh, Teddy's cursed aspects. And uh, I figured it would look nicer than some poorly edited image that I photoshopped out of one of the movie posters or one of the stills in the, in the movie. So yeah, thank you so much to Gambit. Their socials will be in the description below if you want to commission them for any kind of art if you like their art style and whatnot so um yeah uh, aside from that i don't have much else to say this was a very long video to make i'm recording the last bit right now and i am i'm slowly but surely <laughs> bringing back my sanity from from making this video because this was this was a pretty big video for me to do a lot of research went into the video <laughs> But this was like one of the, those videos that I had in the back burner for a little bit. It's one of those videos that I've been wanting to get to for a while now. Uh, but what what's happening after this? I didn't, I'm, I'm going to be honest, uh, for a while there I had kind of like a... a I kind of had a little bit of a list going on of, of videos I was planning out weekly. But uh, I kind of stopped doing that to fully focus on this very big project of mine and uh i have a couple of other big projects in the works as well i still have to do the uh winter in eden video which is the sequel to my west of eden uh video that i did earlier this year that i'm hoping to continue uh, because people have been asking about that and i do want to continue it i do have the book i am currently reading it uh but before i do that i have to i have to do the, the main thing that, you know, the thing that most people are probably wondering about, and that's the uh, paleontology fringe theories iceberg. The final episode, my plan is to, like, as soon as this video is done and uploaded, my plan is to continue, like, just fully work on the next episode of the paleontology fringe theories iceberg. Who knows? Maybe I'll run into a topic 
that looks interesting and I might want to cover sometime next month. And I'll try to get to that uh, on top of trying to do the paleontology fringe theories uh, iceberg video, the last episode that I'm trying to get out. <laughs> We'll see how it all we'll we'll see how it all plays out. Okay, I don't I don't plan ahead that much, especially now after I've fried my brain watching Theodore Rex like three or four times for this video. <laughs> but my next big project, you know, my my next big big project is gonna be the the last episode of the Paleontology Fringe Theories Iceberg. So um, I know I'm taking a little longer on that. I'm gonna be honest, I haven't really progressed that much since the last update I gave, <laughs> but. I promise that I'm going to put a lot of focus on it, if not my full focus. But until then, I just hope you guys enjoyed this video. But that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you all so much for watching, and please, have a nice day.